Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I want to dive into five statistical concepts that are so common asked in data science interviews. And they are power of a statistical test, type 1 error, type 2 error, confidence interval, and p-value. Sometimes the interviewer will ask you to explain these concepts to a non-technical audience. And that requires you to not only have a good understanding of all these terms, but also deliver them in a very intuitive way. If you ever find it difficult to answer this kind of question, this video is definitely for you. By the end of this video, you will learn how to showcase your knowledge on these five concepts to both technical and non-technical audiences. The methods I'm going to teach you will not only apply to these five concepts, but to other concepts as well. So if you're ready to dive in with me, then keep watching. To start off, I'd like to share with you a few steps to follow when explaining technical terms to a technical person, such as a data scientist. You may think this is pretty trivial. If the audience is technical, then the person is expected to understand everything you say, right? But the fact is, if your answer is disorganized or obscure, it's very hard for people even technical people to follow. So here are the steps I recommend. We can start with talking about where or when a terminology is used. Then we provide a definition of that terminology. Even if we are explaining it to a technical person, this should be easy to understand. It should not be obscure, like what you see in Wikipedia. Afterwards, we can explain the meaning of changes in values if the concept can be represented by numbers. Basically, what does it mean with a larger or smaller value? The final step is optional. We could talk about the application of the term in practice, such as why the concept is widely used, why it is important in data science. Sometimes you are asked to explain technical concepts in layman terms or to a non-technical audience. It requires you to explain things in a very intuitive and understandable way. In such cases, using examples is a good way to explain a terminology. I will show you later what examples to provide for each concept. Also, it's important to avoid introducing more technical terms. For example, when explaining power of a test, you don't want to introduce hypothesis testing, null hypothesis, or alternative hypothesis. This will confuse the audience even more. Now you've learned the theory, let's now put it into practice. For the rest of the video, I will go through five statistical concepts, including power, type 1 error, type 2 error, confidence interval, and p-value, to show you how to explain them to both technical and non-technical audiences. The first concept is power. First, let's explain it to a technical person. I will follow the steps I shared earlier to give you the answer. Statistical power is used in a binary hypothesis test. It is the probability that a test correctly rejects the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. To put it in another way, statistical power is the likelihood that a test will detect an effect when the effect is present. The higher the statistical power, the better the test is. It is commonly used in experiment design to calculate the minimum sample size required so that one can reasonably detect an effect. The next terminology is type 1 error. Type 1 error, also known as false positive, it is used to categorize errors in a binary hypothesis test. It occurs when we mistakenly reject a true null hypothesis. It means that we conclude our findings are significant when in fact they have occurred by chance. The larger the value, the less reliable a test is, meaning that we want to minimize the type 1 error of a test. Type 1 error is commonly used in A-B testing to show that we observe differences between two groups, but in reality, there's no difference. The third one is type 2 error. Type 2 error, also known as false negative, it is used to categorize errors in a binary hypothesis test. Type 2 error refers to false negative. It occurs when we fail to reject a null hypothesis, which is in fact false. Basically, we conclude there is not a significant effect when actually there really is. The larger the value, the less reliable of the test results, 
meaning we want to minimize the type 2 error of the test. It is commonly used in A-B testing to show that we don't observe differences between two groups, but in reality, there is a difference. We have just explained three concepts in a technical way. Now let's see how we can explain them to a non-technical audience. For example, if a person wants to test if he's infected by coronavirus or not. And there are three scenarios we care about. The first scenario is that the person is indeed infected by the virus and the test result shows us the same. That is the power of a test. Basically, it is a chance that the test result tells us a person is infected when he truly is. The second scenario is that the person is not infected but the test result shows he is. That is a type 1 error. This can be really bad because the person may take some medical treatment that is completely unnecessary. The third scenario is that a person is indeed infected but the test result tells us he is not. This is a type 2 error. It is also very bad because the person may miss the best timing to get the treatment that he really needs. The next concept is confidence interval. Let's explain it to a technical person first. Again, I will follow the steps that I mentioned earlier to explain it. Confidence interval is used when we want to get an idea of how variable a sample result might be. The confidence interval is for the true value, but we never know what the true value is. And the purpose of having samples and observations is to estimate the true value. The confidence interval is a range of numbers. It tells us how often it would contain the true value. And the probability of it covering the true value is the confidence level. A common use value is 95%. The wider the interval, the more uncertain we are about the sample result. So the more confidence we want to be and less data we have, the wider we make the confidence interval to be enough confident of capturing the true value. In short, the higher the level of confidence, the wider the interval. And the less the sample, the wider the interval. Okay, that's how we can explain confidence interval during an interview. I want to highlight a common misconception. It considers that the confidence interval answers this question. What is the probability that the true value lies within a certain threshold? Well, this is not what the confidence interval is answering. Because the misconception assumes the true value is a variable and the confidence interval is deterministic. The correct understanding is just the opposite. The true value is determined by nature, but it's unknown to us. It will not change at all. The things that can change are the boundaries of the confidence intervals, which are estimated from the samples and the level of confidence we set. Basically, for a specific confidence interval, the true value is either 100% within it or not. The 95% refers to after the 95% confidence intervals computed from many samples, how likely it would cover the true value. Now, let's try to explain confidence interval to a non-technical person. Confidence interval measures the level of uncertainty when we try to estimate a value. For example, we want to know the average height of men in the US. We can randomly select 30 men and measure their heights. And let's say we can get a 95% confidence interval and let's say it's 168 to 185 centimeters. The confidence interval we have means that it is likely to cover the true average height of all men in the US. But how likely? If we repeat the process over and over again, we expect the confidence interval we construct to cover the true value 95% of the time. The next terminology is p-value. Similarly, let's explain it to a technical audience first. P-value is commonly used in hypothesis testing to connect the dots between observation and conclusion. It is a conditional probability measures the probability of getting testing results at least as extreme as observed results, given that the null hypothesis is true. A low p-value indicates less support for the null hypothesis. In practice, we often choose 0.05 as a cutoff value. 
p-value less than 0.05 denotes strong evidence against the null hypothesis, which means the null hypothesis can be rejected. And the value larger than 0.05 denotes weak evidence against the null hypothesis, which means the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. It is commonly used in A-B testing when we have a treatment and a control group, and we want to test whether a metric is different in those two groups. Suppose we have done the experiment and obtained the measurements from the two groups. The smaller the p-value, the more we are convinced there is a difference between the two. I have just shared with you how to describe p-value during an interview. I want to point out one common mistake people make when interpreting p-value. Very often, we have observations and we would like to prove there is a difference between two groups. The mistake people make is to define p-value as giving the observation the probability of there is at least such a difference between the two groups. In other words, they believe p-value captures the probability that the null hypothesis is true given the data observed. It may sound reasonable at first, but it's almost the opposite of the true meaning of p-value which is that, given the null hypothesis is true, the probability of obtaining differences at least as large as the data we observed. Now you understand why the misconception of p-value is wrong. Let's try to explain p-value in layman terms. We could reuse example when we explain confidence interval, and that is, we want to get the average height of men in the US. We randomly select 30 people and get the measurement of their heights. But now the question is, we want to know if the average value is the same as a fixed value, say 175 centimeters. The p-value connects the dots between what data we observe and what conclusion we could draw. It tells us that assume the true value, i.e. the average height, is 175 centimeters, how likely we observe the data. A very small p-value, let's say less than 0.05, means that Assume the true average height is 175, the chance that we observe the data is very low, or the data we observe is very extreme. So we believe the true value should not be 175 centimeters. So that's how we can explain p-value to a non-technical person. Note that we did not introduce any terminology, and we use a very simple example to explain it. During interviews, it can be hard to come up with good examples quickly, so I recommend you to prepare some examples for some of the commonly asked concepts. If you are interested in learning more about how to answer real questions in data science interviews, stay tuned for more videos to come. As always, I appreciate you for watching this video. Let me know if you have any questions or feedback. I will see you in the next video.